Today's National Pork Board is a catalyst for bringing pork producers together with other stakeholders to build a bright future for the pork industry through research, promotion, and education. Those efforts are powered by the Pork Checkoff, a small portion of the revenue from the sale of every pound of live pork in the U.S. set aside to fund the work of the Pork Board. But what operates effectively today grew out of turbulent roots. More than 60 years ago, there was no united front for pork. As competitive forces actively eroded the market for pork, more and more voices called for producers to band together for their own survival. It's extremely important that we all work together to solve the, the problems that, that are facing us. And, and pork producers have been very proactive in and when a problem is identified, we work together until we find a solution. We had lost 30% of our income potential. And during that period, it was time to do something. And that's when the pork producers decided to, that they had to do something, organize and made a voluntary effort then to change their, the position of the industry, had to change the image of the industry, had to change the image of the hog, had to change the image of pork. I'm not even sure it would be existing uh, close to where it is today if there hadn't been some coming together uh, of, of people with a vision, and they had a vision. And again, I think that vision was to help us help ourselves. The first modern pork producer organization that put these concepts together was the National Swine Growers Association, founded in 1914. By 1956, the National Swine Growers Council's list of aims and purposes offered a set of ambitious goals that still resonate today. They focused on improving the quality of pork, presenting a unified voice for pork producers, using promotion to increase the consumption of pork, safeguarding both animal and employee health, and eradicating disease. While the enthusiasm was there in 1956, so was a big problem. The National Swine Growers had no staff, no money, and no means by which to address their ambitious set of goals. Fortunately for today's pork producers, the early association leaders were not timid people. They had lofty goals and, perhaps more importantly, the courage to do whatever it took to move toward those goals. After several failed efforts, including a large checkoff in 1940 and other efforts in the 1950s, in May of 1966, what is now known as the National Pork Producers Council met in Moline, Illinois, a gathering that has become known as the Moline 90. And I wasn't in a very good mood when I came to that meeting because we had started planting corn the 1st of May and following that we had uh, two weeks of icy cold wet weather and this would have been my first day to be able to get back into the field and we had this Moline meeting where nothing supposedly happens and uh, I decided today something is going to happen. And I uh, came to the meeting and chaired part of it. And uh, I got a $100 check out of my billfold and laid it on the table. And I said, who in this room wouldn't do that for our industry? And I think we collected uh, hundred dollars from everybody that was there. While Kepi's pledge of one hundred dollars, about the market value of three hogs in that day, was a bold move, every producer at the Moline meeting followed suit, committing not only their money, but their leadership to the future of the pork industry. The Moline 90 meeting definitely planted the seed that materialized to, to what we have now. And um, that uh, it was, you know, well, we had some futuristic uh, uh, minds at that meeting that could envision that what could happen if we got together and did things together. To uh, paraphrase the good book, there were giants in the earth in those days, mm -hmm. and those people saw the big problem that the industry had, and they were big enough to dare to do something about it. And they got their heads together in the lane and did something.
the Moline 90 meeting launched the voluntary checkoff era of the pork board. Not only did the meeting participants put their money where their mouths were, they committed to selling the nickels for profits idea to others. Led by NPPC Executive Director Pig Paul, producers in 20 states organized themselves into small teams and fanned out, literally going door to door to convince fellow producers to join the voluntary checkoff. The uh, effort really was to get producers with a, a, a set of goals and commitments that they could make and then talk to their neighbor about that, talk to the producer down the road, talk to the hog market. Despite a few bumps in the road, the Nichols for Profit campaign was initially a huge success. Along with raising funds, the campaign encouraged growth of what Pig Paul called pig pride and pork power. And these producers had pride more than anything else. My guy, the, the pork industry deserves better. But they were quite passionate. They were willing to take time out of a very busy schedule. These were all unpaid people. There was no compensation even for gas or for mileage or for meals. This was all out of their pocket and yet they came to meetings time after time. Um, they would take days out of planting or out of other busy, busy things because they believed in the organization of people together to, to make a difference for the product they were raising. The voluntary program soon witnessed enormous growth in state and county pork producer organizations. By 1968, NPPC was the largest dues-paying commodity organization in the U.S. Funding grew from virtually nothing to about $10 million by 1985. Great progress was seen in programs to address the most critical of pork industry needs. But by the mid-1980s, cracks started showing in the voluntary model. Oh, I remember the early days uh, back when I was with uh, the Iowa Pork Producers and we had the, the voluntary checkoff as really the funding mechanism. Uh, while it was very successful at its time, I think we all uh, felt that we were spending a fair amount of time, maybe more than we should have, on the funding generation side of our, of our work rather than on the problem-solving aspect uh, of, our, of our work. In other words, we spent more time trying to, trying to find ways to generate the money and the resources and maybe not as much time as we wanted to in solving problems for the industry, whether that be in the promotion front or the uh, production research area, what have you. While the voluntary checkoff program was an important successful first step and powered critical early organizational growth, pork industry challenges such as disease eradication, the image of pork, and the use of nitrates in preserving pork, to name a few, were increasing on the state and national level, even as voluntary participation started to decline. When I went with the Pork Council, we uh, had a voluntary checkoff at about 45%. About 45% of the producers were checking off. Uh, within five years, we had 47%. Uh, and uh, soon after that, it began to drop off and we got down to about 41%. So uh, what we're looking at here then is a downward trend. And we knew that if we were ever going to be able to finance the programs that were necessary to uh, meet the challenges that the industry had, that we would have to get a higher percentage of producers uh, supporting it. About this time, the pork product was also taking a beating in the marketplace. The greatest threat to the pork industry in that day and time was the fact that we had uh, a fairly lousy product. It was uh, fat and, and, um, and was declared to be unhealthy and, uh, and brought on heart disease. And so we uh, then uh, uh, could see, the industry could see, that there had to be some kind of organization and adequate resources to bring about a change and also convince the consumer that uh, it was a, a, a good product. Ultimately, the fact that about 50% of farmers were funding efforts that benefited 100% of producers didn't sit well with producer volunteers. It also became increasingly clear that meeting the mounting challenges to the industry would require 100% participation with no room for so-called free riders. We must work together. The only way this industry has ever gotten any place is working together to all have all participants participating. The only way to include 100% of producers was to use the power of the government to compel participation. As with every other pork producer initiative, the move toward federal legislation started at the grassroots with the formation of what was known as the 100% Task Force, led by Carl Johnson of Minnesota and John Harden of Indiana. 
Naturally, a proposal for compulsory checkoff participation caused some heated debate. You'll never have everybody agreeing 100 percent, but if they stick to promotion and merchandising, it helps everybody equally. The nature of the enemy now has become much more sophisticated, and because they work together, it has raised the imperativeness of us working together and being able to present something like a united front and being very clear about what our positions are and sometimes we've forgotten how important unity is in getting where you want to go. So out of all of this give and take and all of this discussion came a unified plan that the pork producers were willing to stand behind and every state pork association signed off on the plan and was willing to go forward to try to make that plan effective. The next step to implementing the 100% plan was a massive undertaking that was, once again, powered by the efforts of countless individual producers to convince Congress that a mandatory checkoff program was something that pork producers supported. One of the nice things about it was, though, that producers over the years had become great leaders. As we talked about with the voluntary checkoff program, they had uh, the ability to articulate a set of goals and values that was important to them and why they were willing to put their money on the line for a self-help program for themselves. These were not congressional tax dollars that we were talking about. These were producer dollars that they wanted to be able to spend on producer issues, but they needed the permission of Congress to allow that to happen uh, and to have government oversight to ensure that it was done correctly so that anyone who didn't necessarily agree with the program could at least be ensured that the money was being spent fairly and within the scope of the law. Again, strong producer leadership won the day. And out of the fire, strong steel was formed. Congress passed the Pork Act of 1985, which was included in the 1985 Farm Bill. And the mandatory checkoff was enacted. As an organization that represented grassroots producers throughout the 45 member state associations, the National Pork Producers Council was well positioned to obtain grants from the National Pork Board to carry out programs of research, consumer information, and promotion. NPPC was also structured well to carry out the administrative roles of accounting, communication, and maintaining intellectual property. So the NPPC soon became the general contractor for checkoff programs, handling most of the operational tasks. So I think that the, the real advantage that we saw when we did move to a, uh, a much more efficient funding mechanism was that we were allowed to devote a much, much higher percentage of our resources towards problem solving for the industry, things that really mattered to the producer, the th kinds of things that they really needed to have done for the industry, as opposed to spending time uh, excessive amounts of time uh, in the fundraising process. The whole idea of efficiency was really prime in our mind and, our, and in the leadership's mind. So the pork board really hired only two staff people, collecting millions of dollars and yet um, one staff person, executive director plus an administrative assistant were hired. Um, they had the support of banks and other uh, uh, institutions, but that's really all that producers want to spend their money on in terms of administration of the checkoff. Uh, their job also was to make sure the Pork Act was followed and that there was a good liaison with the USDA. But fundamentally, efficiency was really top of the list and minimizing duplication. Producers liked the arrangement, which worked well from 1985 to 1998. And the pork industry did make great strides in both product improvement and promotion. One of them was among the most famous advertising campaigns in U.S. history. From the 40s and 50s, there had been a lot of concern about pork not being the kind of meat type hog that they wanted, but the pig had changed a lot over time through great research and great uh, changes in the way that uh, producers were, were raising their pigs, the pig was now a different kind of animal. And so in order to, uh, to declare to the public that this was a different kind of animal, a different kind of advertising theme was necessary. And Pork the Other White Meat did exactly that. It crashed through the, the normal thinking about pork and allowed pork to be seen in a very different way. It was one of the great successes of the early pork checkoff days. The most delicious things happen when you cut into pork, the other white meat. 
All was well until 1998, when market forces sent shockwaves through the pork industry. An oversupply of pigs collided with dramatically lower processing capacity, sending prices plummeting to eight cents a pound, which was lower than the price for hogs during the Great Depression. Scores of pork producers lost everything, including multi-generation farms. With livelihoods and ruins, some producers looked for a scapegoat, and the checkoff became an easy target. Calls flooded in to the pork board. At the office, we got lots and lots of calls. As a matter of fact, for three or four months, as I recall, that's about all we did there. Uh, devastating calls. And, and all you could do was be sympathetic to the terrible plight of these people who were losing their businesses and, and their way of life in, in many respects. Angry pork producers launched a petition drive for a referendum on the future of the checkoff, which happened in late 2000. Checkoff leaders found themselves once again arguing the merits of pork producers working together to promote their industry. I think anybody who doesn't, that's part of the, the pork industry and doesn't believe we need a checkoff has really lost a uh, a focus of what this industry is all about. As you think about how far the industry has come in the last 15 or 20 years, I think it's, it's fair to ask, where would we be without the checkoff? And probably fair to say no one really knows that answer, but I think uh, in some ways you do have to look at the numbers and, and, and things that you can measure as far as the progress that we've made. I think the pork industry right now is flying at about 10,000 feet with the potential of going on to 100,000 or more. And to lose the check off now would be like cutting off the engine of a plane that's doing 500 miles an hour at 10,000 feet. That uh, there'd only be one direction for it to go. They don't have to promote it. They don't have to merchandise it. But they won't be raising it very long unless somebody is. On January 11, 2001, Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman announced that there were 14,396 votes for continuing the checkoff program and 15,951 for ending it. There was a decision by the Department of Agriculture to shut down the checkoff program. That was very traumatic. I spent many hours talking to the leadership at USDA trying to explain to them why that was not the right decision. But at the end of the day, that was the decision that was made, and uh, having to deliver that message to the pork board was, was very challenging, very painful, but it was something, as a public servant, I was obligated to do and carried that mission out, but certainly uh, my heart wasn't in it. While there was shock and dismay over this, there were still so many unanswered questions about what the process had been. There were unanswered questions about whether the petition process had been handled right and whether the secretary had authority to have validated the petition. There were questions about the referendum process itself and whether or not the ballots had been correctly counted or not. Just nine days after Glickman announced the checkoff had been defeated at the ballot box, a new Ag Secretary, Ann Veneman, was sworn into office. Upon a review of the irregularities and multiple questions that led to the initial stay by the district court, Veneman rescinded Glickman's order. And I was elated when, when the decision got reversed. Veneman and NPPC entered into what was called a separation agreement that kept the checkoff in place, but with conditions. One of which was that the NPPC and the pork board separate their activities, and that NPPC should no longer be the general contractor for checkoff projects. Essentially, she directed the National Pork Board to take over the duties that had been performed on its behalf by the NPPC, which meant it had to become its own general contractor, conduct its own programming, and coordinate all of its own activities. The separation agreement went into effect on July 1st, 2001, but there were four more years of court challenges to both Glickman and Veneman's actions. The District Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals both ruled that the checkoff had to cease operations within 30 days, but in 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately ruled that the mandatory checkoff was valid and should stay in force. This was four years of difficulties as we faced these challenges to the very existence of the checkoff time after time after time. And yet I'm really proud to say that the board and the staff were so supportive of this effort, were so focused on delivering programs 
that we kept on going even though those challenges were out there. If anything, maybe it made us tougher and more focused because we knew we had producer dollars to, to spend in the most efficient manner for programs that would make a difference for them. Today, the National Pork Board and Checkoff continue to build on the legacy of leadership and service to the industry. The Pork Board works in partnership with the National Pork Producers Council and the many state pork associations who believe in something bigger than themselves and work with great passion to achieve the goals together that they know they cannot accomplish alone. No, I don't think the job's done. Uh, the, the business of promoting a product, the business of improving a product is a journey. It's not, it's not a destination.